Good morning, and thank you for joining us here on uh, the live Q&A. So this morning we'll just be answering questions, anything to do with flow hives and beekeeping to help you get started in beekeeping. So if you've got questions, put it in those comments below and trace our, um, our office uh, manager who keeps the wheels on will read those questions out and we'll try and answer all your questions. If you've got answers to people's questions, also chime in. Now, I was wondering if we could harvest a little bit of honey this morning, but I'm looking here going, no, the bees are still hungry. And I can tell that because of the way they are chewing out some of the cells. You know they're hungry. If I look at the back of the hive here, my suspicions are confirmed with uh, the cells were all full like that, but they've eaten some of the honey away. So right now we're going to leave the honey for the bees and we'll just answer questions today. Last week we were in a hive pulling it apart and having a good look inside. So if you missed that one, go and have a look at that. Are there any uh, questions coming in, Trace? Oh, Seeds, you are quick off the ball this morning. Everyone, of course, wondering, it's such a beautiful day in winter up here, and just wondering, do we winter our hives up here? That's a great question. Um, the answer is not here where we are. We're in a subtropical region, and as you can see, um, I'm wearing a T-shirt. You do get some cold days, but not cold by, uh, <laughs> by a lot of people's standards. Now. What we have here is you can even see things still flowering and you get some quite good honey flows down here in the heathland in the winter time. So we actually get more honey in winter here than we do in summer. But springtime is the time when we get the most honey. So for here we don't really have a winter as far as the European honeybee Apis mellifera which is the honeybees that humans have taken all around the world because of their amazing ability to pollinate and produce enormous amounts of honey. Uh, they are from Europe and they actually are built for those long cold winters where they're storing a lot of honey for the times when there's not a lot of flowers. But here we get dribs and drabs of flowers all year round, which means we don't really have to change the configuration at all unless there's a problem with the colony. So we can leave it in this configuration all year round. Anyone in the subtropics or the tropics can, can leave it like that. If you're in the colder parts where it's really uh, is um, getting those chilly nights or, or there's snow ahead and all of that, then there is things to do to prepare your hive for winter. And we've got some great uh, info on the beekeeper.org about that. Um, but basically it's about managing the food supply for the bees by making sure they have enough honey stores, feeding them if they don't prior to winter, and also thinking about the hive size. Perhaps if you've got lots of boxes on, you take some off and right size your hive for your colony. And one more tip is if you've got an excluder and you are in those cold southern parts of the southern hemisphere here, you're probably a, a good idea to take that excluder out let the queen, the queen roam free, otherwise she might be left behind when the bees move up to consume honey up here and she could perish under the excluder with no one to, to feed her. Great, so you know, Gary's tuned in from Northern California, a new beekeeper, um, installed a package in late April and every so often, usually about the same time of day, sees a swirl of bees flying around the hive. How can I tell whether this is an ori orientation flying, robbing or a swarm? Okay, so often orientation gets confused for swarming. Now, they are a bit different if you start to observe them up close. Now orientation will be a less of a frenzy and typically the pattern that the bees do to, um, to when they're orientating is if you've, you've had a, a few days, perhaps it's been raining, perhaps it's been a bit grey and cold and there's meanwhile a whole lot of bees that are emerging from the cells inside the hive, they're, they're starting to do their chores and they will wait like um, good little bees for an appropriate time to do their orientation and they'll do it on group as a mass 
So you, you might find that it's the first sunny patch after rain. You'll see a, a whole lot of bees, as you say, it, uh, sort of flying aimlessly around the entrance, which can look like a swarm if there's a lot of them. So they're all flying around here in a big, big cloud. And what they're doing is they're just taking off, flying around and coming back again to, to the uh, hive. And uh, they're taking in landmarks and that's their first flight. They're testing out their wings. They're orientating to this spot here. And they really do kind of GPS lock to this spot using landmarks and who knows what. They're quite intelligent like that. So um, swarming on the other hand, you'll see this kind of mass mar marching exodus when they swarm, where there's literally a moving carpet of bees coming out of the hive continuously. And they'll typically start uh, uh, flying around in a group somewhere in the air and consolidating themselves into a swarm. So that's the start of a swarm. This is interesting what's happening right here. And it, it, it also, we, we observed that there wasn't much honey. And right here, I just observed a worker bee trying to tear the wings off a drone. So it's a bit brutal, but a hive, when it comes to the scarce forage, the, bee, the drone bees don't do any kind of service inside the hive that we know of. So they're the first ones to go if they need to downsize the number of hungry mouths in the hive. So the worker bees will actually kick them out and they'll jump on their backs and they'll try and pull on their wings and so on. So uh, that also confirms what I'm seeing in the observation windows of the bees aren't storing any honey, they're actually consuming it at the moment. So that's why we're not doing any harvesting here today. It's like we have just may have had a little computer freeze and it may be just that Callum's getting down okay. deep in the Let's hive. Okay, let's wander around the corner where we have uh, a bit better reception. So um, hopefully it'll come back online. So walk down, look at this cool art here on this hybrid. It's super neat. So Sarah's done an amazing job here of painting this hive and you can really have a lot of fun if you want to get your kids out painting on the hive and uh, enjoying the, the artwork on the box. Great, that's good now, we're, we're back on. The Aracaria wood does need to be painted, not um, stained or oiled, so, so if you do order that type then you need to give it a good coat of, of outdoor house paint, but why not go to town and do some art on the hive. Great. Cedar Mel's asking, calling in from Newcastle here in Australia and northern New South Wales, or New South Wales, just wondering what is the best time of day for the, for the bees to harvest and inspect? So the best time of day for inspecting is mid-morning to mid-afternoon on a nice sunny day. Now would be perfect time for, for doing a brood inspection. What you've got is a lot of bees out foraging at that time and they're less interested in protecting and guarding the, the, the hive. So you've got calmer bees, easier to work with at that time. And bees, they seem to be uh, moody. And some bees particularly on a grey day will just be a bit grumpy and a bit more aggressive. So, so mid-morning to mid-afternoon, nice sunny day for harvesting, sorry, for inspecting. For harvesting, on the other hand, that used to be in the conventional fashion when you'd also do your harvesting because again you're pulling apart the hive. Now with the flow hive you can actually harvest at night if you want to. You can harvest uh, in the rain if you want to. And uh, you'll obviously need to, to cover up your jar so the rain doesn't get in. But it does open up a lot more um, windows of opportunity to tap a bit of honey and enjoy that honey with your family. Okay, we're back again. Hope you can hear us. Give us a thumbs up. We're having a few technical problems here with the uh, interwebs. So away we go again. Questions, Trace? Ah, seeds. So hopefully you can hear me now. Um, just wondering, um, let me just see. Why do we use single brood boxes? Are there any advantages? Okay, so it's a choice as a beekeeper to how you configure your hive. I like to do it like this because it's simple. If you're looking for the queen, there's only one box to look through. Uh, if, you're, um, 
you know, less boxes to lift off when you go to do your, your brood inspections and so on. So just keeps it simple really. The, I guess, one of the drawbacks is you'll need to manage swarming a bit more if your colony's actually um, smaller. And to do that, it's a nice idea to do splits. So I prefer to run smaller colonies, split them in spring, than I do to run large colonies and try not to let them swarm. And that just keeps it, keeps it nice and simple. But if you want to add extra brood boxes or extra supers, by all means, go and do that. A lot of beekeepers do. And, uh, and that will um, increase the size of that colony. And in some places where you've got long, cold winters that the bees have to bunker down in, it is a good idea to add a, either another brood box. So they've got honey storage up the edges of the hive. Yeah, they typically store honey on the edge frames so that will give them a bit more storage. Or you might add another super for a bit more storage of honey as well to get them through that long, snowy, cold time. Great, thanks, Ed. And I just want to shout out too, because we had a little freeze there, we've lost a couple of those questions. So if you've typed one and can you just put it back in for me, that would be great. Um, there was, a, I know there was a question wondering about whether a flow hive would work in South America. Okay, the answer is yes. We have, we have flow hives in South America. And it's a, good, um, it's a good area. A lot of honey does get produced in South America. It's one of the, uh, the larger honey producing countries in the world. And they actually have a lot of our eucalypt trees from Australia here, beautiful honey, uh, interestingly enough. So, so South America, yes, you'll be in a more um, subtropical or, sub or tropical region, depending on where you are. Climate might be similar to here where you can actually get um, honey flows coming and going all year round. Great place to keep bees. Great. Um, Chris is asking, do we have a hive brand on our hive, which we do, and I think Chris was also wondering where we put our um, our beehive number seeds on their side of that brood box. There. Okay, so we usually just write them down in the corner because we're doing a lot of show and tells. We don't have them big and loud and proud, but if you have a look on our boxes, you'll see We've got our number just written down in the corner there. And uh, that's a requirement here in Australia to have your hives numbered with your identification number and to register your hives. And there's a little donation there to help keep bees uh, healthy in this country and keep away the, the varroa mites from coming in and all sorts of good things. So, so make sure you, you do register. We do send out reminder emails for that. But if you haven't yet registered your hive, then um, go to the DPI and register and you'll get a number two to write on your hive. And you also get things like um, access to AFB tests and things if, you're, if you've um, identified some possibly problematic um, cells in your hive. Great. Jill's asking, does colour matter at all when, when painting the hive? The answer is no. Bees don't care. The, uh, your neighbours might. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your neighbours might. Um, but have a little think about if you're in a really, if you do really have hot summers and your hive's in the sun, then you might want to use some lighter colours so the hive doesn't get too hot in that summer sunshine. Great. And um, also noticing that we often seem to paint our western red cedar hives roofs. Is there any reason for that? The roof really does get the, the weather, it's got the sun beating down on it, it's got the uh, dust and things collecting on it, it's got the birds that poop on it and so on. So it gets um, the, the, a lot of the weather and if you don't paint it you'll find it um, will be more susceptible to cracks and things and water coming in and so on. So what you want to do is give it a good weather seal with some outdoor house paint and um, get that paint in any cracks and crevices to provide yourself a weather seal on top of your hive. Great, Jill's come back with the colour. She goes, bright yellow it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maria's in the snowy mountains and just wondering how hard is it to keep bees in colder climates? So we've got a lot of flow hive beekeepers in colder climates and the, um, what you need to do varies a little bit depending on where you are. We've got people keeping bees as far up as Norway with flow hives. We've got a lot of people in Canada. We've got a lot of people in Europe. So 
we do have a lot of people keeping bees in cold climates. Now, we answered a question um, earlier on, but it was in the other thread before the uh, technical problem. But basically, what you need to do in a colder climate is adjust your hive a bit for the winter to make sure if you've added extra boxes that you reduce the size down to a manageable size that the bees can keep warmer over winter. And the main thing you need to do is make sure they have enough honey stores to survive. If they don't, typically beekeepers will feed them prior to winter with a thick sugar syrup to make sure they've at least got something to survive on so they can make it through a long, cold, snowy winter. And bees are very good at that. They're amazingly good at surviving six, seven, eight months with no flowers, knee deep in snow, so incredible. Great, Bic's uh, calling in from the Gold Coast, just up the road. Just wondering with the change of seasons and lots of trees in their yard, uh, their hive isn't really getting any direct sunlight. Sh sunlight. Should they move it a little with, or because of the damp? Not a bad idea. This hive here, we actually did the myth busting with the chalk brood on, and chalk brood is more susceptible in a hive that um, has uh, dampness and cold. So moving it into the sun is not a bad idea. If you've got an ideal, uh, the ideal situation is a bit of sun in the winter and in summer, you've got some shade, especially in the afternoon, as that sun really beats down on your hive. Now, um, this hive here, it's still got the chalk brood issue and we've worked out a way, our next step, and we worked out what our next step is. We um, tried the banana skins, didn't work, and um, the next thing we're actually gonna do is change the, we're gonna take away all the brood comb, so we're gonna add another brood box, l let the brood emerge from, from here and have an excluder underneath and they'll start building down below in another box so they have fresh comb. And then um, we'll also replace the queen for some more hygienic genetics. And I think that'll sort it out and kick out that pathogen. You can see here, we're still having a bit of trouble in the tray with a couple of these chalk brood um, mummies here. So you can see them there. If you see them in the tray, these chalk brood things then that's a sign that your hive's struggling with that fungus but sunshine helps so good question nice one seeds now this bevan's got a, a bit of a, a, a long question here but a good one from Mackay in queensland uh, the bees have been storing nectar in cells and as soon as the bee, as bee is born there was nowhere for the queen to lay. They, they haven't been going up to the flow frames to store nectar. So added an, a second brood box with foundation and the bees used all the nectar to make wax for the new frames and now they are back filling with pollen. I still don't have room for the queen to lay eggs. What do you recommend? Okay, so that's... Uh that's a great question and well done for being so involved and noticing so much in your hive. The, generally, the bees will sort that out. So if you're not seeing any brood at all, and I'm not sure whether you are or you aren't, um, then you've, you've probably got a, 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 a problem. Perhaps your queen isn't laying. If you're only seeing a tiny bit of brood and you, there is a lot of nectar around, then perhaps the queen um, isn't laying enough and you might need to change her for a, a new one that can lay um, a lot more eggs. So, so generally you don't have to manipulate to allow space for the queen. The bees will do that if they need space, they'll just shift the honey upstairs and make room for the queen to lay. There is something called honey bound though, where if you've got a hive and there is no space to move it, then um, the queen might struggle to find enough places to lay. So it sounds like perhaps you did have a honey bound issue. You put more boxes on, but they're still not moving it. And my answer there would be they will move it when they're ready to. Um, and the flow hub boxes on top, as I understand, 
if you want to get more activity on your flow frames, then I would take the other box off and just reduce to this configuration, let them get started on the flow frames, and then put the other one back on. But of course, you've possibly got brood in there, or maybe you've got all honey. Um, you can either store some honey in a in their full frames in the freezer to put them back on again, or uh, temporarily for a couple of weeks you could leave them off the hive, but longer than that and you might get issues with um, fermentation and uh, the beetles might find it and so on. So, <laughs> um, long answer to, to a long question. No, good <laughs> answer to a long question. But yeah, the, <laughs> the short answer is if the bees need room to lay and there's empty space in your hive, they'll move it when they're ready. Great. Eric's asking, and he's not, he's asking not because he's worried, but just I think interested and loves checking out his hive, and it's probably a question we get asked a lot actually. Just wondering, um, at night time outside he goes out and checks his hive and there's always a lot of bees hanging outside the hive. Um, he's in Oklahoma, southeast Oklahoma. Just wondering why do they do that? Okay, so they're uh, just enjoying the evening air, really, but uh, they need to make room in the hive to ventilate. So we don't have any examples here because we're on the flip side. It's winter here. The colonies have shrunk down a bit. But if you're in your season where the bees are really building up, then you can, you can uh, notice that if they, they're not all fitting inside the hive, or even if they are, and, and the day's been warm, a whole lot of them will have to come out of the hive to allow room for the bees to get the ventilation going, get the airflow going and maintain the hive, particularly the brood nest, at about body temperature. So the bees are busy trying to manage that and too many bees in the, in the house means they can't, so they're literally just vacating to allow ventilation. So it's a perfectly normal thing on hot days if your colony's healthy and there's been some good nectar flows to see a lot of bees at the front, uh, often hanging down a bit, sometimes spreading right up the front of your hive, it means you've got a good strong colony. If you've got that many bees in your hive, you might consider taking a split and getting another colony going, or, uh, or you could add another brood box or super. If you don't do anything, it's potential that the hive will swarm. If, if you open the side windows and you can't see the frames, there's so many bees, and it's in that season where there's a lot of nectar, they may gear up and half the hive will leave for a new home. So you really want to avoid that. It's hard to be around all day waiting for them to swarm and to, to catch the swarm. So um, you're better off getting ahead of the curve and taking a split and starting another colony. If you don't want one, somebody else will. I sure will. Chris is asking, Cedar, um, just your opinion on venting hives, and do you leave the vent on your inner cover open or closed? It's quite a topic, really, the, the ventilation. Um, and it's the old, if you ask uh, two beekeepers, you get five answers. But basically, the, the vents here on, on these hives are designed for you to control it if you want to. So we've got vents down here, we've got a whole lot of cooler nights at the moment. And what that means is the, um, the, this piece of wood rests up against this here and stops the airflow going up under the screen and up into the hive. So it makes it a bit more cosy for the bees. In the warmer months, we turn it around this way. Having said that, if you speak to some people around the globe, I was speaking to, to a very experienced beekeeper in Europe recently, and he said that they use a mesh bottom board like we have, screen bottom board, and no ventilation stopper all winter, and it's fine. And they've got snow, they've got really cold times, and they don't even bother with any kind of ventilation control. They just allow it fully open at the bottom. So there you go. You've got um, a few different options there. The, I guess the answer is I wouldn't be too worried because um, I wouldn't be too worried about cold, but when it comes time to your bees are getting a bit hot and they're, they're really bawling out the front and trying to fan and cool, then perhaps uh, give them some more ventilation if you haven't already. Or you can even take the tray out altogether and give them a lot more airflow. 
into the hive. Great, Zeta. Ron, uh, Rhonda's tuning in from Florida, the USA, and is really excited. Just finished painting um, the flow hive and getting right. really excited. But also as a native plant gardener and recently read that raising European honeybees can be detrimental to native bees. Just curious on your thoughts on that. Okay, so th that question's been coming up quite a bit lately. And... I, I keep some native beehives as well, the little TCBs, and I often see them foraging on flowers together without animosity. And it's my, I guess, personal opinion that the nectar flow ebbs and flows. There'll be plenty for everybody, and then there'll be times where there's not much for anybody. So I think um, that it's also important that we really think about this topic carefully. There's so many parts to it, so this will be a long answer. But yes, here in Australia, the European honeybee is not our native bee, but it's become an essential part of our food chain. It's now vitally important. One third of the things we eat wouldn't be there on the supermarket shelf if we didn't have pollination by the European honeybees. A hive like this can pollinate 50 million flowers a day. There is no other insect or thing on the planet that can do that. So they ship hives from Queensland to South Australia to do pollination. And if they don't, then the almonds won't set, for instance. So we've got an agricultural system that relies on the European honeybee, on beekeepers, on uh, uh, intact pollination network. So that's an important piece to the puzzle. So if you go, well, let's not keep um, the European honeybee, then we're in trouble. And the other bit is, I think it's a important thing not to infight really. People who are sticking up for the European honeybee and people are sticking up from the native bees, are both after the same thing, and that's safe habitat to forage on. And that's really the thing we need to be focused on, is not whether this is better than that, it's let's get some habitat going, let's get more safe flowers for bees to forage on, let's support our native bees, let's support our butterflies, our bats, and everything that, that is nectar feeding. And that's why we started our Billions of Blossoms program, and that's being funded by the beekeeper.org. If you haven't checked out that, have a look. It's an online course, experts from all over the world, made to take you from square one right through to even a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping. And this year we're really happy to be planting a million trees from the funds from the beekeeper.org. And we're doing that because we recognise that habitat is the key here. And habitat's what we all need to, to um, be doing, whether it be in our backyard or on a mass scale. Because without that habitat, then the native bees will go extinct. The Europe European honeybees will have more and more trouble and eventually won't survive. There are places in the world where, where bees of any type won't survive simply because the habitat isn't there for them. There isn't the biodiversity, there isn't the balanced diet, and people are climbing up trees with feathers to pollinate the apples. So, 420 million hectares since 1990 of forest has been destroyed. We need to start putting that back. And that's why we're planting a million trees this year, and hopefully we'll be doing the same thing next year. Great, Cedar, that was a good question, wasn't it? Got you going on that one, that was good. Cedar, um, David says he's in Brisbane and he's just bought his second flow hive getting ready for warmer weather in Brisbane um, to install the nuke. Just wondering because he's saying that his inner cover came without a plug in the hole. Ah yes, you've probably got our classic that doesn't have a plug in the top. So you can cover that easily with, a, uh, with anything you like, a, a little piece of wood, a brick, uh, you name it, if you don't want them to come up into the roof cavity. When we originally launched, we left that hole there for people to feed their bees. And it, we were basically, because we had the, the lion's share of the orders were 
from the USA were following the trends that were going on over there. And they tend to just leave a hole often open. So we sent the inner cover like that. Uh, but we since learned that here in Australia, bees get so busy, they'll fill up the roof with honeycomb, fun for a little while, but then, uh, you know, it's a bit tedious to clean out. Um, and so we now supply the plug with our flow hive too, to, to, to plug that and then not allow the bees up into the roof cavity if you don't want them to. Right, so the Charles is northeast Canada where they have really cold winters. So the question is, is it okay to keep the flow frames with the honey in it on the brood box and remove the queen excluder? Um, the question is, because can it break the flow frames if they freeze over winter? No, no. I've done extensive testing in, in cold and I've, I've still got um, frames sitting at minus 18 degrees for the last um, six years and that they're still fine. So, um, you know, it does get colder than that in Canada, but your, your frames will be fine in the cold. Uh, if you do have any problems, do let us know. There was a run of frames that um, wasn't that good, but that was going back a number of years now. Um, and there were some issues we've had to fix up for customers, but you shouldn't have any trouble with your flow frames leaving them on if you choose to do that. Get some local advice on whether you should be leaving your super on in your area but I don't see why you shouldn't. If you remove that queen excluder the bees can get up there and consume that honey. The queen's not going to be laying at that time so you're unlikely to get any uh, eggs in your flow frames but come back to springtime then you will need to shake all the bees down to the bottom box and put your excluder back in place to um, then make sure your queen is then laying in your brood frames. Some queens will lay in flow frames and some won't, so it's luck of the draw. Some people choose to run with no excluder. I've got some hives like that, but um, it's very queen specific. Great, um, so to just back on that, in a plug again, Chris is just wondering, w would a mesh vent on the inner cover be okay? Sure, so if you've got a hot time and you do want to allow ventilation at the top, you can experiment with putting a mesh vent. My um, thoughts on it are, uh, the bees usually just block it up with propolis, they don't really want ventilation at the top. Any kind of ventilation at the top seems temporary and the bees will block it up in my experience. What they like to do is get a nice cycle of air going from the top to the bottom and it kind of makes sense because the bees uh, can then control that, they can fan that, they can do their air conditioning where it's, if you've got holes at the top it's got the chimney effect and all the heat's been drawn out uh, at times when they might not want it to. So that's why they get up there and block up the uh, holes in the top. Great, Cedar John's in uh, southwest Australia and just finding a little bit of water in the, um, their bottom tray, just wondering what's, what do you think that, what's going on there? I don't know if it's raining or? So yes, rain can drive into the uh, entrance of your hive. So if you've got driving rain here, if we had an easterly wind and a lot of rain, then it's pretty hard to stop it coming into the entrance despite our efforts of putting slopes there and so on at the front. And what you'll find is water will build up in the tray. So if you've had a bit of rain, especially wind and rain, then pull your tray out and just empty it out and clean it out. This one's all dry, as you can see. Uh, we've got some sunshine now, but um, it hasn't filled up with water recently, which is good. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes you'll find that you'll have one hive facing away from the wind direction and it'll be completely dry in there even after flooding rains. Um, so it does seem to be specifically about the, the wind and the rain together. Nice. So the, um, just there's a few questions coming in about where to buy hives and parts, but please get in touch with our fabulous customer support team about them, those questions and answers. Thanks, um, Trace, you, you recognise her voice. If yeah, if you wait half an hour, I'll probably answer the phone. So. <laughs> <laughs> what um, we've done there is we've put uh, warehouses in strategic places around the world. We manufacture here in Australia and we ship them to, uh, to Europe, 
to the USA, to Canada and so on. And that way, if you order, no matter where you are in the world, it'll be uh, usually just a few days before your box arrives, unless you're in the more outlying places, in which case it might take a bit longer. You'll probably be used to that. Cedar, with the, uh, with the trays and the hive beetle here and using um, the vegetable oil, uh, there was also a discussion about maybe using soapy water. Is that just water with detergent or is it just straight up detergent? That's water with detergent. It does work quite well. Now, condensation, if you've got a whole lot of water sitting in your tray uh, and it gets to the cooler time of the year, you might get some condensation build up. But otherwise, experiment with it put some water and some detergent. It's a little bit cleaner than oil, a bit easier to clean out, and it does also catch the beetles. And the reason why is the beetles and bees have an exoskeleton that they actually breathe through. And if you block that with oil or detergent, then it will actually um, kill that insect. Now, uh, it's important not to allow the bees into that area, so just make sure the bees aren't getting in if you're trapping beetles down the bottom with oil or detergent. Cedar, so as a beginner beekeeper, how do you know if it's too late in the season to start your beehive? So it depends entirely where you are in the world. Here, right, especially on the coast, we'll get some good nectar flows and people will be starting hives in the winter time. You can almost start any time of year, although Right now they're a bit hungry, so right now isn't the best time. So if we were taking a split or ordering in a nuke or anything like that, we'd wait um, until things pick up a little bit. But it's a good idea to get your equipment, get it all ready, and if you, the easiest way to get started is to order some bees from a bee breeder, and a nucleus is the easiest way to do that. So what you'll need is um, to place that order and when they come, You'll have your box all together, you'll have it all painted and ready. Get in your bee suit, get your smoker, transfer them into the bottom box here, look after them and they'll grow from there. So, so it's about being prepared. Now, it's a good time now in Australia to get prepared, get everything together for the, for the springtime to come here. Spring will start in the middle of winter with everything flowering. Nice. Cedar, we often recommend um, people in colder climates using seven frame flow hives. Why should people in colder climates use a bigger hive? So this is what we call a six frame and this is a seven frame flow hive. And the difference is this one's 52 millimetres wider or one flow frame wider. In the bottom box we've got eight frames here and ten frames in the bottom box. So that's an eight frame Langstroth brood box, it's a 10 frame Langstroth brood box down the bottom. So they're the two common hive sizes in the world and that's why we went for those sizes so you could match what people already have. And the reason why in colder climates the larger one is preferred is because you typically get honey storage on the edges of your brood box and they use it as a thermal mass and that allows them to have a, a, a bit more storage in their hive if you have a bigger hive. Now typically, um, the, if you've got a double brood box, there'll be a lot of honey in that next box up. So it's really just about storage and a slightly larger colony, which will help survive a long, cold, snowy winter. So that's the reasoning. Having said that, a lot of people do keep bees in the smaller size in the cold places as well. Ask uh, to experience beekeepers and you'll get three answers again. <laughs> and so Cedar, does it also mean if you're in a hot climate, can you still use a seven frame flow hive? Yes, absolutely. It's a very common size here in Australia and New Zealand and uh, the USA is this 10 frame size. There's been a bit of a migration towards the smaller size by beekeepers simply because the boxes are a bit lighter to lift when they're full of honey. So that makes them a bit easier to manage. Rose is um, just saying, added the super went on a few days ago, the brood box is about 90% full and can see the, bo the bees in the super but they just seem to be just walking around a bit lost she's saying. <laughs> How long before you reckon you'd be seeing activity? Weeks? Months? 
And uh, where are we in the world again? It doesn't actually say, but, but she's saying um, it's 70s during the day. So okay. I'd say the US. Yeah, okay, moving okay. That. Yes, so it uh, all depends. The recipe to get a, a good... Um, a good amount of honey stored in your flow frames is lots of bees in the box coinciding with a good nectar flow. Now, if those two things don't happen, then you might be waiting a while. Sometimes the colony's taking a while to pick up speed, the, the queen's not laying, sometimes you can have issues that will mean you're not getting enough new bees. Um, other times it's simply just there's not enough out flowering to trigger the queen to lay enough eggs to really get the population up. What you need to, to get some honey stored is, is some nectar flows that stimulate the bees to, to the queen to lay more eggs. The population booms, they, they fill the top box and they keep going and getting that nectar and then they fill the flow frames. So sometimes you do have to exercise some patience to get those two things coinciding. It's exciting when they do and you can get those exciting moments where your uh, harvest or your flow frames you come back to your hive a week or two later and they fill them up again. It's really exciting when that happens, but equally you can go through a whole season with no honey storage at all. And I guess that's like any type of farming. You get your good seasons and you get your poor ones. Here in Australia where we are, it has been a, a poor season for us. We've had lots of floods and rains that have actually limited the bees uh, and they haven't been able to get out and get the nectar but sunny days hopefully things will change now. Yeah Cedar um, uh, when you look in the rear access cover and it looks like there's not much honey but have done an inspection and realized the flow frames are full of honey except a few of the sort of the the, the flow frame cells at the front don't look full can I still harvest even though it looks like there's no honey in my rear access cover? Yes, so, so well done, you're onto them. The bees have cleaned out the last cell or two just to trick you so, <laughs> so you, that you won't harvest. <laughs> no, probably not. Um, but genetics plays a little bit of a role in whether the bees will fill the frames to the edge. And you can get situations where all of the hives except for one of them is filling that to the edge and, and one won't. So you could have genetics at play or you also could just have the bees um, haven't had quite enough nectar to fill to the edges. But if, if you have gotten in there and had a look and you can see plenty of honey, then by all means go ahead and harvest. Uh, you want it to be at least 70% capped with their capping on there so that that moisture content will be down below that 20% range and will keep in the jar on the shelf so your honey won't ferment. Nice. Um, Chris is asking, he's got quite a lot of, or they've got quite a lot of um, hives in their apiary, and just wondering, Cedar, what's your preferred method of keeping track of them, of your inspections? Do you use an app? Do you write it down? I think um, this would be a good one to shout out to the audience to ask what everybody's using. Some people use a book, some people use an app. I have to say that um, I struggle with running, you know, a company and a family and everything and keeping track of everything. So I've actually got other people that do that for me, that keep track of which is what in the apiary now. And one person uses an app, another person uses a notebook. At one stage we had a, um, a big board up on the wall that Trace, who's reading out the questions, was filling out of what was going where. But it's a good idea to keep track, especially um, if you are moving things around. So um, if you do have an outbreak of AFB or EFB, for instance, you can know where that equipment was shared to. Flow hives are great in the regard that you can just keep the equipment with that hive. You're not taking all of the boxes off the top, going to a processing shed and trying to bring them all back to the same hive, which almost never happens. <laughs> um, so it, it does limit the spread like that, but um, because we're doing all sorts of wonderful things with bees, we do move things around sometimes, so we do keep a track of that uh, just in case. Yeah, and I think sometimes Pete, who lots of people would have seen on Facebook Live, who does a lot of the April stuff, he keeps pretty intensive notes 
and then he puts them onto this big spreadsheet and that's how he, and he uses his phone a lot I think for notes, that's what he's doing. Everyone's tuning in with their ideas and apps that they're using which is great. Um, See, so Gary's asking, I get asked about package bees a lot. Um, most people don't realise your population drops significantly significantly in the first three weeks before growing. Do you agree on that? On a package, yeah. that makes a lot of sense because it's not something we do much here. We have ordered packages here just to, to really see what that's like. Some places that's a popular way to get started in the world. It's basically an artificial swarm where a beekeeper or breeder has shaken a lot of bees into a box they put in a, a, a mated queen in a little cage with a block of candy at the end and they've shipped it to you in the mail. You get some interesting uh, looks from uh, the post person when they rock up <laughs> with this buzzing uh, uh, box of bees. But that is one way that does happen in the world. And you're probably getting maybe 5,000, 10,000 bees in your package. And what you'll then do is shake them into your box and they'll, and they'll start from that basically like a swarm. A few days later the queen will emerge from her cage after the candy's been eaten away and away they go. Now you can expect a bit of a dip as you say because if you think about what they need to do they need to create uh, enough comb to do all of the jobs in a hive so they need to create comb for the queen to lay in and that's something she'll start but you can't actually, uh, no young can be raised until they've also got some uh, nectar and some pollen stores to feed those, feed the young. So it's, um, it's a, bit of a bit of a dicey spot in, in the starting of a colony where they don't have the framework to, to do everything they need to survive, but they need to build that before all of the forager bees actually uh, come to the end of their life, which might be four or six weeks. So they hopefully, fingers crossed, will get it together. They usually do, and you'll have a thriving colony in the months to come. A um, couple of people saying they can't believe that you can send bees in the mail. <laughs> yes, and you can order queens in the mail too, right? <laughs> which it, it is quite entertaining as well, because they come in little little cages with escort bees. So you'll get one queen and about five escort bees in a little cage with a block of candy at the end. And you might have 50 of them uh, arriving. You get a call from the post office to say, hey, you better come and get them. They're here, don't leave them over the weekend. <laughs> and uh, it's like, great, great, off to get the queens. And you can get Russian queens, Carnolian queens, Italian queens, and uh, depending on what the queen breeder is breeding. Great, Cedar, what's your best tip for somebody who wants to start um, with a flow hive? Okay, so my, the way I learn is I just jump in. I just go full in and get started and learn as I go. But it's not everybody's way of learning. Other people like to do a, a course, perhaps physically going and, and learning from a beekeeper. Some people like to learn online. We've got the beekeeper.org if you want to have a look at that. It's getting great reviews. Uh, other people just like to get their equipment, get started, and if they have a question, they'll research it, ring someone, find out. Getting a mentor is a great way as well. So it's, um, it's all about making sure whatever way you like to learn, you're learning. And it's a fascinating journey all the way. There's so many intricate, interesting things about bees and it's such a rewarding thing to nurture them into a full-size hive and get the beautiful honey spoils. So I guess tips to getting started would be jump in, get into it. Being prepared is a good idea with your equipment so if you know you want to start start bees then um, get your equipment get them painted and so on sometimes we find issues where somebody's ordered their bees first and then for whatever reason there might be a supply chain interruption which there's is a bit of in the world at the moment and we've got a situation where the bees have arrived but they don't actually have the box for them to go in so get your equipment first and get going
fantastic. And Cedar, a question actually that a lot of people do call up about is they'll, they're beginners and they'll say, oh, I want to just start with the small one. Yeah. Um, can you explain like whether, like really the difference, I guess we've got the hybrid through to the seven. Um, people often say they want the small one, but literally they're kind of similar sizes sort of, and does it make much difference when you're starting out? So bees, they need a certain amount of room and if you give them a tiny hive, what happens is they will swarm often. So about this is about as small as you want to go. I mean, you'll start off with just the bottom box and it'll look like just a small hive with the pig rift on top. It'll sit like that in your yard for a while until the bees have built up and then you put the top box on. But once they're a going colony producing honey, you really need a, a, at least this size hive. You can't really get away with much smaller. I do know some beekeepers that keep sort of half size colonies because they, th they say they make more honey in that configuration, but it's pretty rare that somebody's keeping hives smaller than this. Fan fantastic Cedar. Chuck's saying um, he's had his flow hive for five years now, which is fantastic. They've produced very well, but on the second year and this year, the bees seem slower to take to the flow frames. Any reason you can think of? Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, it's particularly if they're already waxy. So usually um, if you're having issues with the bees, it's starting out and starting to build on the flow frames. It'll be when they're brand new and bees haven't made it their own yet. But once they're all waxy, they should be really treating them like any other frames in the hive. So uh, not sure what's going on. It'd be interesting to benchmark that against some of your other hives and see whether that colony's a bit slow or whether other, other hives in the area are getting a similar thing or whether they're getting a lot of stores and you aren't. If they're getting a lot of stored honey and you aren't, then it may be time to introduce a new queen to your colony to really pick up the pace a little bit. But if everybody else is uh, get, finding the same thing, a bit of a poor season, then that might just be what the season is. One tip would be if you've got lots of boxes stored, then reduce it down uh, to a smaller colony and they'll be quicker to fill a smaller size box because the, um, they'll be quicker to fill the flow frames then. So you might like to take some of the other honey supers off. Great. Cedar, do I need to have, as a beginner, uh, uh, safety equipment, bee suits and smokers? Absolutely. So if you haven't ordered them with your purchase, you will get a reminder email about that. Uh, it's important to make sure you have your safety equipment, you have your bee suit. I'm not wearing one right now. I'm an experienced beekeeper. When you're beginning, make sure you're looking after yourself and uh, you, you don't want to have an issue where you get a lot of stings early on um, because that, that it could be um, just a, a bit frightening. Some people also have um, allergies like they do to peanuts and things from stings, so be aware of that as well, but you will need a bee suit, you'll need your gloves, you'll need your smoker, you'll need your hive tool. They're all important things. Um, the only sort of um, exception to that, in fact, there isn't an exception to that. Even if you're getting somebody else to manage the colony for you, you'll need those things just in case um, when you're going close to the hive, the bees are, are getting a bit territorial. Some bees will be like that. So you'll need your, your, your bee suit and your bits and pieces. Right. Rhonda's asking Cedar, is it possible to start a hive without a nuke or a split? Oh, don't you love that bird noise? I don't know if everyone can hear that. That's that is... the whip bird. Yeah, it's so good. It's a tiny little bird. It makes such an amazing crack sound that it almost blows itself off the branch. <laughs> it's almost blowing me off. Um, yeah, back to Rhonda, sorry. Um, is it possible to start a hive without a nuke or a split? Um, Rhonda's got lots of bees in the yard. Could, could you just order a queen and the bees will all come on in? No, so it's a little bit of a caveat to this question. Um, the answer is no, what you need to do is order some bees or take a split from somebody else. Now there is one thing called a swarm trap, which if you happen to be near a whole lot of beehives and it's springtime, then you could increase your chances of catching a swarm without having to shake them in yourself. And you can set up the brood box and uh, set it 
probably six to 12 feet off the ground, a few hundred meters from a bunch of other hives. And what you might find is a swarm will think that's a very cozy home and move in. So it does happen, but it's pretty hit and miss. So the reliable way to get started is to take a split from a friend or order some, some bees from a bee breeder. Great. Jill's wondering, do bees prefer a variety of flowers or is it okay to just have one type of flowers dominating for the bees? Uh, basically, there's, uh, bees do need a variety, but um, often you'll find they do dominate. So if you've got um, a situation where you've got, say, all canola or rapeseed around you and that's the only thing that's flowering, Bees will eventually possibly get sick because they don't have enough variety of pollen. Bees need a balanced diet just like we do and if they're always on one thing then they will get sick. So typically there is enough other things flowering around to keep them going and farmers are, are learning now and this uh, bee friendly farming is something that, that's uh, picking up pace in, in the USA and here in Australia where Farmers are now allowing um, hedgerows of flowers for not only the European honeybee but the, all the native bee species to allow um, basically a more balanced diet which is important for the bees. But you will get big pulses of things and that's okay where um, maybe it'd be all ironbark flowering on the ridge and that's what they're going for. But you know next next month you might find it something else and so on so you get those pollen stores coming into the hives and uh, providing that balanced diet so um, not a straight answer but um, the answer is yes they need biodiversity great cedar uh, kimberly's asking not sure where kimberly is can they add my flow super this year with a new new colony after they've built out the frames and the brood box. Um, not really wanting to take honey, but just trying to get a bit of a head start for next year. Okay, whereabouts were we? Well, that's, I'm not quite sure, so maybe we need Kimberly to let us know, but. Okay, so we'll just, uh, best time to add the super is when the bees have filled up the bottom box, so they've drawn out all of the frames. There's lots of bees in there, and you can add your super. Caveat on that is if there's a, a winter ahead, perhaps wait till spring, and or at least probably the, the last parts of winter before adding the top box. If you're in the subtropics here, you could add it pretty well any time because you might get some good flowers in the winter time and the tropics the, the same. So really just avoid making a whole lot of empty space if there's a cold winter ahead. Fantastic, Cedar. And look, we're coming up to, God, we're going well today. Our lucky last question here. Cedar, if I was to purchase a flow hive um, in the US, oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so if I'm purchasing a flow hive in the US, can I also purchase all the other uh, products that you sell online via your website? Absolutely. So. We're set up with warehouses in, in the, the major places, so there'll be one in the US, one in Canada, one in Europe, here in Australia, and, and what that means is if you order the hive or if you order the bee suit smokers, it's all stocked there, ready to get to you, usually within a few days. There is supply chain interruptions at the moment that a lot of people are dealing with. We haven't fared too badly, so you probably still find it comes quite quickly. Thank you very much for all your great questions, for tuning in today. Let us know some of the things you'd like us to cover and we will put together some, some nice um, live streams and Q&A for you same time next week. Thank you very much.